All right, happy Thursday, everyone. Um, it is a few minutes before five o'clock and we will be starting promptly um, at five. So I'm just gonna give everyone a few minutes to settle in and then we will be back. Hello, Senator. Welcome. Hi, I thought it was 530. You're it, it, my last email. My bad. We are um, live right now and recording. We're just waiting till five o'clock to start officially. Okay. All right, it looks like we are officially at five o'clock. Um, so to be respectful of everyone's time, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, so I am Jennifer Krishka, CEO of the Jewish Women's Foundation of the Greater Palm Beaches. And I am happy to be here with Takeda king Pang, uh, the Executive Director of the Women's Foundation of Florida, who will be moderating this evening's panel discussion. Um, and JWF and the Women's Foundation have come together to partner on this panel discussion. So thank you to everyone for being here and thank you to all of our elected officials for participating. Um, just a couple quick housekeeping guidelines uh, for anyone who's interested in submitting a question during the Q&A session. Please use the Q&A feature um, and not the chat feature. Thank you. All right, so I think that we are ready to go to Kida. I'm going to turn it over to you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, excited to be here this evening. Um, big thank you to our senators and representatives for being a part of this discussion tonight. We really appreciate you making the time for us. Um, I'd like to go ahead and I'm just going to introduce you by name and give you a few moments to introduce yourself and share um, your district boundaries with everyone. And I'm going to start with State Senator Lori Berman. Thank you and good evening. Um, thank you so much for having us here. Thank you to Jennifer and to Kita for putting this program together. Um, I represent Senate District 31, which is pretty much central Palm Beach County. It goes from Lake Worth to Del Rey, from the ocean to mostly the turnpike. There's some places where it zigzags a little bit beyond the turnpike. 
Um, and I just want you all to know that I am a member, I am a trustee of the Jewish Women's Foundation in South Palm Beach County and have been a founding trustee. So I was trying to think, I think we started around 2004 or five. So coming up to 15 years or so. Thank you for having us and look forward to the discussion today. Thank you so much. Up next, Senator Tina Polsky. Hello, good evening. Thank you for having me here today. Um, I am a newly elected state senator. District 29 uh, runs from uh, Northwest Broward County um, into Palm Beach, mostly it's Palm Beach. And I have all of Boca, um, Highland Beach, uh, western parts of Delray, Boynton, Lake Worth, all of Wellington, Bell Glade, and South Bay. Um, I was a state rep for the last two years in a lot of the district in southwestern Palm Beach County, and I'm looking forward to the discussion here today, so thank you for having me. Thank you so much. And next, Representative Kelly Skidmore. Good evening. Thank you, Takeda and Jennifer, for inviting me to participate. Um, my name is Kelly Skidmore. I'm a state representative for District 81, which is west of the Turnpike in Boca Raton, Delray Beach, Boynton Beach, Lake Worth, and then a little bit of uh, Wellington that connects the district out to the Glades. So the three cities of um, Pahokee, Bell Glade, and South Bay. I um, am a freshman Democrat um, in the Florida House, uh, was elected in November, but I have served previously. I served in the Florida House from 2006 to 2010, and I was a legislative aide for 10 years for someone, some of you might know, Ron Klein, and served in the House and Senate uh, as staff. So looking forward to this session, um, this conversation um, that, uh, about women and girls, um, which is uh, one that's close to my heart. So thanks again for having us. Thank you so much. And last but not least, Representative Emily Slosberg. Thank you. And thank you, Takeda and Jennifer, for, for inviting us to participate. My name is Emily Slosberg. I represent House District 91, which is Boca, Delray, and Boynton, um, east of the Turnpike and west of Military Trail. I was elected in 2016. Um, this last term, I, oh, this term, I'm coming in as co-chair of the Legislative Jewish Caucus, and I was the vice chair of the Legislative Women's Caucus. So I, I'm really looking forward to this discussion today. Wonderful, thank you so much. So for our discussion this evening, we have um, prepared a few questions in advance and shared those with each of our elected officials. Um, but I wanna give each of our legislators an opportunity to talk about the work that they're currently doing. So you have three minutes each to share what your priorities are in this upcoming legislative session. And also please definitely include how are the folks that are participating in this program can support you and, and help push through um, good legislation that I know you're all sponsoring. Um, so is there anyone that would like to go first? Nope. All right. I'll just go in the opposite order. I just went in. So we'll start with Representative Emily Slosberg. Thank you. Um, so one of my priorities, one of the reasons I got into the legislature has been traffic safety. I lost my twin sister and I was almost killed in a car crash. So a lot of my priorities have been traffic safety. Last session, we passed legislation that um, made, made it a primary offense to text and drive in the state of Florida and it was hands-free in school zones. And so this session, I'm going back with House Bill 91 to make it hands-free for the entire state of Florida because distracted driving, it, it really is, a, it's, it's been, it's horrendous in our state. Everywhere you go, you see people with their, their, their hands on their phones and, and this is gonna you know, save lives, not just for Floridians, but for our guests. So I have House Bill 91 and it just has been referred to four committees. So it's gonna be a challenge. I mean, anytime a bill gets referred to four committees, <laughs> it's a challenge, but um, I'm looking forward to working hard and, and trying to you know, do these life-saving changes in our state. Another issue that I've been working on is, um, is against animal cruelty. I filed House Bill 177, which is um, basically in the state of Florida, you can, you can leave a dog chained if, as long as it has food or water and, and, and 
yeah. So this would make it, yeah, this would make an offense to, it basically says you can't tether your dog or cat unless you're present. And also during Hurricane Irma, we've had, we had instances of people just getting up and leaving their, their dogs um, tethered. And there, I think there was about 45 cases of, of this. And so um, we're creating penalties against, you know, leaving a dog or, or a cat tethered um, unsupervised. And another priority is House District 91 is home to the second oldest demographic in the state. So the first oldest house district is where the villages are in the state. And I represent the second oldest demographic. So I'm working with Ruth Rails, a senior community center um, in, my, in House District in Delray on getting um, a, dish, a, a program for, for their, their community center and it'll provide transportation um, for our residents in our senior community. And it's really a it's really critical in House District 91. Um, last session, it got passed in the budget and then it was vetoed by the governor. So I'm looking forward to actually making this pro you know, getting this project this session um, with Ruth Rails. It's called Rails Rides. So, and those are my priorities. Awesome, thank you. I like the Rails Rides. I'm a very big fan of alliteration. <laughs> Next, um, a representative Kelly Skidmore, if you'd like to share um, your priorities and what you're working on this session. Thank you very much. Um, when I served previously in the House, not to, to be looking backward and not forward, but I focused a lot on healthcare issues. And um, it seems that I will be doing that again this year um, based on my committee assignments. So I have um, been assigned to Health and Human Services Committee, um, the Healthcare Appropriations Subcommittee, the Professions and Public Health Subcommittee, Tourism Infrastructure and Energy Subcommittee, and Government Operations Subcommittee. And yes, I was cheating. I was looking at a list. Um, so uh, healthcare is, uh, is uh, um, incredibly critical right now. We do have a pandemic uh, committee that was created um, that is a standing committee. It's not just temporary. So I am um, very interested in figuring out uh, what, what the plans will be if and when the next pandemic um, hit because we have been completely unprepared um, from day one uh, for the pandemic, for the uh, testing, tracking, tracing, um, any of the executive orders, and now with vaccine distribution. So this is going to be a huge issue um, for all of us in the legislature and something that I uh, plan to focus on. I, I don't want to just be critical of what has uh, happened and transpired, but uh, to offer solutions going forward um, to what we could and should uh, do um, to make uh, our community more safe and, um, and uh, not so fearful. Uh, it is incredibly important to do this for, for not just our health, uh, physical health and mental health, but also for our economic health. Um, in the state of Florida. And if we uh, cannot get our arms around the positivity rate and it continues to skyrocket, um, our businesses are going to continue to fail. Um, and we need those businesses to support the jobs for all the people who are, uh, are unemployed and suffering. Um, so I think that, that healthcare is gonna be um, a big part of what I am focused on. Um, I often say that um, having been in the Senate as a staff member, moving over to the House, it was like, oh my gosh, only six bills. Now, now we have seven. You know, how, how will I ever decide? And, uh, and sometimes it's hard to find seven good ideas um, to actually sponsor. But um, I, I am very fortunate to work with both Senator Berman and Senator Polsky on a couple of issues. Um, one being the risk protection orders, which creates a process for family members to go through if they have a, a fear or concern about a family um, a member that might have some kind of a break, mental illness, and, uh, and uh, has weapons. Um, we are also looking at um, 
a bill uh, then uh, actually just a street naming bill for some law enforcement officers who were killed in Pahokee. Um, but Senator Polsky and I have uh, created, well, working on a program called There Ought to Be a Law with um, the high schools and boys and girls clubs out in the Glades area. And they are working on proposals uh, to bring forward. And we have a panel of judges um, who will pick the, the best um, idea and we will each sponsor the, that legislation in our respective chambers. So that's always one of the best things that we do. We bring the students into the process, teach them how to, to watch the bill, how the bills are numbered, how they're referred to committee, how they can advocate on behalf of their bill to the committee members and chairmen and chairwomen. So um, I'm really looking forward to that as well. Um, other bills that, that are, are are important, but I won't take up any more time. Um, I'm uh, looking forward to hearing what everybody has to say. Thank you so much. I love the It Ought to Be a Law program. I actually helped Representative Rader, um, well, now Senator Rader, you do that program when I worked in the legislature. So thank you so much, uh, Senator Polsky and Representative Skidmore for bringing that back to the students. I just love that opportunity. Um, and then next we have Senator Tina Polsky. Thank you. Um, you know, you asked what we're working on now. It's just uh, COVID and vaccine and unemployment, you know, 24 seven. So basically um, right now, while we're here in the district this week, that's, and for a long time, that's been, you know, the very serious focus. Um, but at the same time, we're trying to put our bills together. So it's really, um, you know, quite busy right now. So I have filed um, several of my bills. Um, it is great in the Senate to have unlimited bills. So that was worth um, the switch over um, by itself, I think. I'm just going to pull up my list because I'm very bad at memorizing bill numbers. Um, so uh, one thing that uh, those who know me know I've been working on since day one, so this will be my third year filing uh, safer storage of guns. So Florida has a decent law in the books, but there's a massive loophole where um, you judge if this person has stored a gun safely, if it's, been, if it's reasonable. And so th that's a really big hole and this law is never prosecuted. And so, you know, you hear about these tragedies all the time about a toddler or a teen getting hold of a gun and a terrible tragic accident happening. So I'm gonna push for that again. Um, I am I'm stuck with the four uh, committee rules. So it's gonna be a problem for sure. And um, they really just don't like to open up any uh, gun bills, but um, I'm just gonna keep at it because it's, you know, it's just that important to me. Um, a new bill that I'm proposing um, is to make sure that every school and university has an EpiPen in the cafeteria at least. So there's an area where, you know, if someone's eating and they have an allergic reaction that there's an EpiPen available. Um, there's, uh, it's kind of an antiquated situation where we have, and by the way, sorry, I would tell you the name, number of these bills. Um, Senate 428 is my um, safe storage bill. Uh, 538 is the EpiPen bill. 558 is um, a repealer bill that we still have on the books that you can not have a marriage between persons of the same sex. And even though the US Supreme Court has ruled that unconstitutional, we still have it on the books. So I think it's important that that um, particular law comes off the books in Florida. Uh, we just very recently filed a bill that bans um, conversion therapy. And again, we have a court ruling that um, was not in our favor that allows conversion therapy. So we've tried to come up with creative ways to, um, to make legislation that bans some physical activities of conversion therapy and doesn't allow uh, practitioners to advertise because we tried to get a, around what we're dealing with the 11th circuit ruling. But you know, at least it brings this back to the conversation. And once we uh, figure out what happens with that ruling and its final stop, then we can you know, continue to fight to ban conversion therapy. Many of our cities have, and so uh, you know, the state needs to do it as well. Um, another one I'm bringing back this year is uh, we call medical marijuana employee protection, and that is um, 692. And sorry, the one before was 690 for uh, conversion therapy, and 692 is medical marijuana employee protection. And basically, because medical marijuana is legal in the state of Florida, if you are using 
at off work, but you test positive, you could be fired uh, or not hired for a job or disciplined in some way. And that's ridiculous because you are using a legal drug and it's no different than using, you know, a painkiller, um, a Valium or whatever. Um, and so it's really important when we allowed medical marijuana, uh, much to the dismay of the Florida legislature, but uh, the citizens put it forward and was voted on, um, you can't leave this gaping loophole of the workplace. And so I think it's really important that, um, you know, this bill be heard. And uh, we, what we did is last year, we had it for all employers. This year, we're limiting it to public sector because we think that we might have a better chance of passing that and getting it going and getting the conversation. And lastly, um, we're working on some election bills that have to do with candidates and um, the kind of some of the funny business that went on this past election season with no party affiliation candidates being thrown in. Uh, we wanna make it harder for, for people to do that. So an NPA should be an NPA for a year, just like you have to be a Democrat or Republican for a year. That's one bill and another bill we're looking at is to make sure that, um, that no one gets compensated to run because that's what we think kind of happens behind the scenes too. So, uh, you know, working on that um, and some election, uh, you know, voting a little more access, a little more open to dates of people being allowed to, to um, file and get their votes in. So some of those are some of the things that we're working on and um, they'll be, There'll be more. There's um, there's a lot. It's it's kind of overwhelming having unlimited, but it's exciting. So, um, you know, trying to just put them out in a timely and strategic fashion. So, that's what's going on in District 29. That's awesome. I was going to say it seems you're taking advantage of being away from the limited number of bills. <laughs> so next we have Senator Lori Berman. Thank you so much. Um, I like being at the bottom. Usually with Berman, I'm at the at the top. So this was fun. Um, so we've heard, you know, there's four, four major crises right now in the state of Florida, COVID, the economic issues, the racial injustice and climate change, which has been a, an existential crisis, which has kind of been put to the side, even though we live in a peninsula where we're seeing the effects of climate change. Um, I would love to tell you that, and, and we have all been working so hard during this off session. I will tell you, I am starting my 11th year in the legislature. I was a representative for eight years, and this is my starting my third year as a senator. I have never worked so hard in an off session. We ended in the middle of March. Um, our offices immediately got inundated with um, requests for where testing was going to take place and unemployment insurance claims. Now that the vaccine is, off, is out, our offices are inundated with requests for the vaccines. And I will tell you, we are working the best we can, but it's a real issue about shortages and that, and that is a huge problem right now. So I would love to tell you that the Florida legislature is focusing on all those great issues that we have. Um, unfortunately, we haven't seen that so much yet. Um, they're looking at, there's a protest bill that they're working on, um, you know, and our governor said um, recently that his biggest legislative issue was censorship of, um, by conser of conservative news sites, which is kind of crazy considering that we're talking about COVID and economic impact and racial injustice. So I have tried to focus some of my legislation on these issues with regard to um, COVID, I, I'm, uh, and the economic problems, I'm a co-sponsor of the bill to change the unemployment system in Florida to make it uh, a better system. We're one of the worst states in terms of paying and length of time um, that we give unemployment for. So there's, we have a bill that we're working on together to make it go, to make uh, the payment increase to $500 based on how much your salary was, and I believe increase it to 26 weeks. Um, on the, my real number one priority is the issue of racial injustice and equity. Some of you might have seen, I've been doing panels on this issue in Palm Beach County um, with Commissioner uh, McKinley and Congresswoman Frankel. And as a result of that, I filed a bill to create in Florida a cabinet level position of the Office of Equity, Inclusion and Diversity. Um, and I'm really hopeful that that's something that we could do because it's, it's not a big fiscal impact. We know the state is very, is going to see some dramatic decrease in revenues, um, but we could have this office 
um, set it up with with a somewhat one person and a couple people working for them, and we could start to look in the issue of systemic racism and how it's taking place statewide, and having someone who has the governor's ear. So that really is my number one priority um, on the issue of climate change. I have a bill encouraging solar on our schools, and we might expand it to commercial properties. And I and I also have a bill. Um, where we would be setting um, goals for when Florida is uh, energy uh, efficient, um, you know, so we're doing on that and um, just uh, I have a couple bills, particularly for women, one about domestic violence and making sure that guns are removed. And then I have one to create lactation rooms in our courthouses. So um, attorneys who are practicing and even jurors who come or any staff who need a lactation room would have it. And then the last bill I just wanted to run by you, um, I'm working with the Anti-Defamation League. They've tried for a couple of years now. We're trying to amend the state's hate crimes law to include um, gender issues and to make sure that it works better because of there's um, if you have a mixed crime where there's uh, another version, they don't get charged with the hate crimes portion. So we're working to make the hate crimes bill better. And unfortunately, right now we need it. So those are a couple of the bills. I will say it's great to have unlimited bills, but it's also a dual edged sword, um, you know, because we do get so many ideas and it's also hard to tell somebody, no, it's easy when you're in the, when you have seven bills, you can say, no, I'm full already. When you have unlimited, it's a lot harder but it's great to have the bills. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. You all have a lot of exciting pieces um, in play. And so I have the questions before I start, I wanna preface by saying we're pretty aware uh, about the uh, financial situation um, in the state, knowing that uh, the pandemic has significantly impacted travel, tourism, hospitality, um, as well as just the overall economy. Um, and that will have a very clear impact in the upcoming legislative cycle. And so would um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on kind of what we can expect that to look like. What, what should we be watching for? What can we do? I know, <laughs> Senator Berman shaking her head. Um, just in in what are how can we protect our most important programs? What does that look like? What would you suggest we as citizens can do in this situation? Uh, I can anyway, answer. I could start with um, I'll start with some positive things we can do, uh, ways we can bring in revenue, and then maybe someone else can talk about what we're scared of. Uh, you know what would be cut. Um, all of us were on our call today with our school board and they're you know, so concerned about cuts to public education. So that's, it's definitely on the horizon, but um, there are a couple of ways we can bring in uh, more revenue because being so dependent, having no income tax, being so dependent on sales tax and tourism, obviously, you know, maybe this is a once in a lifetime situation and hopefully we never see it again, but it's, it's real. And um, you know, we have to deal with the consequences. So one really simple way that people might not even realize is going on now is we don't collect internet sales tax from a company that doesn't have a physical store in Florida. And so that's, and I don't think many people would mind paying a, a dollar more at, you know, their Amazon order um, or whatever it is to, um, you know, to help our economy. And so if you were buying in a store, you would pay sales tax without even thinking about it. So that is one way. Another way is through uh, Florida film and TV and creating a situation where there's incentives and rebates for films and TV shows to be filmed here. And Florida is a popular destination for that. It's a very unusual geography and beautiful in so many areas. And um, we've lost a lot of that business to Georgia and other places simply because there was a thinking and leadership for a long time that it's corporate welfare to kind of give money to or, or not collect money um, to businesses that want to do business here. And so bringing that back would really help. And those are um, two ways that we could begin to raise some money so that we could help the revenue stream when you know, we have a situation like we're in now. Are you calling on us, Takeda, or are we just? You can go ahead and speak. 
So obviously, I'm, I'm sure everyone knows the biggest pots of money are healthcare and education. Um, so those are the easiest dollars to go after. We know that we have more than 500,000 new Medicaid um, enrollees uh, since the pandemic. That has that growth has caused uh, you know a, additional um, funding to be needed in Medicaid. We have never expanded Medicaid in the state of Florida. And you know, probably everyone on, on this panel would love to expand Medicaid, um, but that, that is, it, it is unlikely. Um, but the reason that we keep bringing issues up like this and we talk about them all the time, um, just like the um, um, ban on gay adoption, you know, we filed that bill year after year after year after year, never got a hearing, never got anywhere. And then suddenly a court decision changes everything. And so we filed these pieces of legislation like expanding Medicaid, not to beat our heads against the wall, but to keep the idea in the forefront so that it doesn't fall by the wayside. So we don't forget about how important many of these issues are. So uh, Representative Polsky is exactly right. We need different sources of revenue. I'm co-sponsoring the internet sales tax bill in the house um, that is sponsored by Representative Clemens. Um, and here's what I will say. I encourage every Floridian to get a copy of the budget um, and spend some time reading it because you will be shocked and uh, dismayed at some of the things the state uh, has prioritized. So while I, am, I understand that we have a, a shortfall of uh, $3 billion between this year and next year, and we are going to have to come up with some alternatives, and we will have to make some cuts, but it's all about the priorities of leadership. And we are um, the ones who have to make sure they know what our districts feel are the most important priorities. So it will be a battle and we will fight, um, but the numbers, you know, they're not with us um, all the time in terms of the votes uh, for in the House and Senate. So it is, it's a, it's a long haul battle um, and having gone through the recession, um, I have never actually seen uh, any budget that wasn't a cut budget um, uh, and voted on it. So uh, I feel like I know where some of the, the hidden treasure is. Um, and I'm looking forward to um, making the, the leadership defend um, some of the priorities that ha they have created over the last 25 years, which haven't been public health or education. I would second exactly what Kelly said. Um, you know, we I anticipate that we will have cuts in social services and they will hurt, they will be deep. I was in the legislature in 2010 when we had to have cuts and it was very painful. Hopefully, um, I would love to see us look at areas of, of getting other money, like they said, um, for instance, gambling. We get nothing from the tribes right now, zero, zero. We used to get um, a couple hundred million, two to three hundred million dollars a year, and the and the deal um, expired. Um, so we need to redo that. We do need to look at other sources of Medicaid, I mean, of, of money for the state, including Medicaid expansion, which would be a great source of money for the state. Um, also, we could, um, if we do some criminal justice reform, we uh, another big pot of money does go into our correction system. So if we did criminal justice reform, that would free up some money for us. One thing to watch out for, like, like uh, Rep Skidmore said, is take a look at the budget. So every year we have the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, the Sadowski Fund, and we are supposed to put a per certain percentage of the doc stamps toward affordable housing. And almost every year, last year, which I'll talk, say in a minute, being the exception, almost any every year they sweep that the, a large proportion of that money. It's hundreds of millions of dollars that get swept. And that's why there is no affordable housing in Palm, right now in Palm Beach County to speak of. Last year, they fully funded it. Then the crisis happened and they took the money back. Um, so it's a real problem in the state. In terms of what you can do, what all of you can do, um, you know, normally I would tell you, come to Tallahassee and have your voices heard because I really think having one-on-one -on -one meetings and showing that you're in Tallahassee because unfortunately Tallahassee's uh, over six hours away from where we are and a lot of the large urban centers. 
and nobody's there. And so they just do things like in the middle, it's almost like in the dead of night kind of acting and nobody pays attention. And if nobody pays attention, they do more, they'll go further. So I know though with COVID, you're not gonna be able to be there, but the best thing that you can do is be, is watch, really watch what's going on, read your newspapers, write letters to the editor, make calls, make emails, but make sure that it's not happening in the dead of night. I, I will tell you, I, I'm really, one of the first bills we're gonna hear in the education committee this week is to allow dual enrollment, which is when children go to, uh, they're in high school and they can take college courses also for private school citizens, private ch school children from our taxpayer dollars. Um, you talk about being in the middle of a crisis. Why are we going to be paying private school kids to go to college, to get college credits? I just don't understand it. And that's the kinds of things that they sneak through while nobody's paying attention. So join me in paying attention, help us amplify our voices. That's really what we need your help for in Tallahassee. Thank you. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, we're either going to have to cut spending or find ways to generate revenue. And just as Senator Polsky said, um, there's that internet sales tax um, I, a bill that's going through that's probably going to be passed. And, you know, there's also money out there from gaming that's on the table. Um, it's going to be a tough session. And, and a lot of our member projects, I've also predict, are, are probably going to be cut from the budget going forward. Thank you for that. I know it's not the, the most pleasant conversation, but it's something I know I have been really open with folks because I think the general public is not always aware of um, how this the, the economic status of Florida is so reliant on tourism dollars. Um, so I appreciate you digging into that with us. Um, here's another fun topic. Um, so in 2020, we passed the ballot amendment that mandates Florida raise our minimum wage to $15. And I know the general public is very excited about this. Um, and I'd love to dig into a little bit about, you know, what you expect the process for that to look like and what challenges lay ahead for the mandatory $15 minimum wage actually being implemented in the state of Florida. I'll take a shot at it. Um, we, we looked and we checked today just to make sure. And so far there has been no legislation, legislation filed about implementing the amendment. The amendment was drafted to be self-implementing, meaning that you should not have any changes. But unfortunately we saw with um, the amendment regarding retur returning citizens being allowed to vote that the legislature gets involved even when they shouldn't. And uh, it, you know, a lot of the, most of these citizens amendments are done because the legislature would not do it in the first place. And so the legislature is not very happy that these things come through and they try and figure out a way to throw a wrench into this. I'm hopeful that this amendment truly is um, self-executing self and we will not have any legislation. If that's the case, starting this year in September, um, the minimum wage will go up to $10 and then it will increase every year thereafter until 2026 when it goes up to $15, which is the height of it. Um, there are, we're the eighth state in the country to raise the minimum wage to $15. And um, we're actually the first state to do it through a ballot initiative. I think there might've been a ballot initiative in the city of Seattle, but we did it statewide. Um, I know that President Biden has announced he's looking into some uh, $15 minimum wage issues also, which may end up overruling ours. But right now, let's hope that ours goes into effect and we do start seeing the, the raise in the minimum wage in the state of Florida. I would just add um, that there is going to be a lot of concern. So you might hear from people that, oh, this isn't the time to do it. We're in this downturn. Um, especially in the hospitality industry. It's a very large lobby, the restaurants, the hotels, tourism, you can imagine. And they were against it from the beginning, even pre-pandemic when everything was booming. So now they think they're just getting, you know, really put upon and no one, you know, they're saying, oh, we won't be able to open our restaurant or whatever. I don't know that to be the case. I mean, I certainly don't know their books. It's hard to imagine that a dollar more per person um, is going to, you know, make or break their bottom line. Um, I think there's a lot of fear out there because of the incremental nature of the implementation. I think that 
you know, companies or businesses will be able to adjust to it. I've spoken to many businesses who said they already are there. So, you know, luckily a lot of them won't have to make any changes, um, but we're gonna hear a lot of criticism about it and the people are gonna use the pandemic as the excuse, but they were against it from the beginning. Um, it is still not even necessarily a livable wage, $15 an hour at full time. So, you know, it, it's hard. There's, there's a very common refrain, refrain, small business, small business, we have to worry about small business, but we have to worry about the individual too. And I think we're here to, in the legislature, to be concerned about the individual. And I think small businesses can make it and will survive um, with this very incremental, very small addition to um, the bottom line. But it's going to be tough over the next few years, and I think we're going to hear it. But you know, this wouldn't have happened but for the citizens and kind of every good thing that we've done. I talked about medical mar marijuana before. We talked about land, land conservation, restoration of felons, voting rights. Um, those only happen because of citizens' initiatives. And for the folks watching, for you younger folk uh, in 2022, I think we're going to have recreational marijuana on there. Um, I hope we have Medicaid expansion. I'm not sure what's going on with that. But the only way we're going to get these things done is through citizen citizens amendments and they've made it harder to do um, over the last two years but it works and uh, there was a lot of analysis you know some of you obviously very interested in politics if you're listening in about the election and so here we, we in florida we elected you know red up and down the board but very progressive policy with 15 dollars an hour so there are people who voted for trump who was against it and yet they voted for $15 an hour, so go figure. But um, it's obviously very popular, it passed, and um, you know we will make sure that it happens, whatever we have to do. Right. I would just add that um, the, the constitutional amendment process, the citizen petition is incredibly important. I know that we hold the constitution as a sort of a sacred document, but it is the only avenue that citizens have um, when there is an unresponsive legislature. Um, the, the issue that I'm concerned about is um, all of the speed bumps and obstacles that continue to get placed in front of the citizen petition, um, including one that was uh, required everyone to vote twice on uh, on, a, on an amendment. Um, and so we have to be extraordinarily careful. Um, we already have to meet the 60% threshold, which was a change. Um, we already have the, the, the Germanity one issue uh, thing that, that sort of keeps everything clean um, until you're in the, um, the Constitutional Amendment Revision Commission. <laughs> and then you can just pile them all together and then it's okay. Um, so I think that, you know, our rights get trampled a, a lot um, in, in uh, this particular process. So we have to be very, very careful. Um, and I, I don't think I have anything to add in regard to the, the $15 uh, um, uh, minimum wage. I think the senators have, have uh, articulated that issue very well. But just in terms of the constitutional amendment process, um, it's really important. You got to watch what the legislature is doing um, and you got to support what the, the, the constituents are doing as well. Absolutely. And we bring up the 15 minimum wage, $15 minimum wage, not just because obviously it's it's good policy for all people, um, but we as um, the Jewish Women's Foundation and the Women's Foundation of Florida are part of an organization called the Florida Women's Funding Alliance. Um, and we have been working with this organization to release a series of reports on the status of women in Florida. And the first three reports all stated that in the state of Florida, that was one of their top priorities is raise the minimum wage to at least $15 to improve the lives of women and girls across the state. And so we know that this one issue can really impact um, women and girls in Florida. So thank you so much for expanding on that and talking about the, the logistics of the ballot amendments because those are always interesting. Um, kind of staying along the same lines, but talking more about jobs. There was a jobs report that came out in December of 2020, and it stated that um, the, the United States of America had lost 140,000 jobs in December. Um, but the breakdown of how they got there was a little disturbing. 
it showed that males gained 20,000 jobs and women lost 160,000 jobs. And so we're looking at this horrible job market for all people, but what now we already know women are being affected by COVID at higher levels and 100% of the jobs lost in, in the United States in December were to women. And so my question to you is how can the Florida legislature address this issue to help women in our state? I know well, I think um, Takeda, women lost 156,000 jobs um, and, and, and then gained 16. So it was a net loss of 140, but, um, and, and all attributed to women. But in fact, women lost 16,000 more jobs uh, than the 140. So um, it, it, it's all rather connected um, and there's some synergies with um, the types of jobs that, that women hold. Um, a lot of uh, teachers retired um, during this time uh, because they were fearful of going back to work in uh, brick and mortar schools. Um, a lot of uh, um, um, restaurant workers and um, hotel workers, uh, maids and housekeeping. Uh, th that is predominantly, uh, those are predominantly female um, um, opportunities. Um, I don't think that we have done a stellar job of um, introducing STEM to our girls. Um, we, are, we, do, uh, 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 we do offer it um, and I think more girls are getting engaged than ever before, but it's still not quite enough. Um, and, uh, you know, education funding is, uh, is under attack as well. So introducing new programming or trying to engage uh, young girls uh, in uh, STEM type um, enterprises, um, entrepreneurship is, is a big challenge that um, we have not, again, prioritized in the state. Um, and it, there has never been, I'm gonna go off track for a second, there's never been a woman speaker of the house, right? In the history of the state of Florida, um, there hasn't been. We broke a glass ceiling yesterday with Vice President Kamala Harris, and we need to do those things in the state of Florida. You have four really strong vocal women on this panel, um, but there's not enough uh, of us in the legislature. Um, we need more strong women to represent um, what the future of, of women and girls are in the state of Florida to make uh, any kind of an impact in, in the world where the decisions are being made. R really well said, Kelly, uh, Rep, Rep Skidmore. Um, you know, you, you definitely outlined the problem tremendously. Um, and somebody wrote, I think Jennifer wrote, uh, pink collar jobs on the chat room also, which is a real problem. And then I think another issue that was part of this whole, and, and that 140,000, I, I am so shocked and so dismayed to see that all the job losses were, were women. It's, it's, it, I, when I saw it, I, I was like, how could this be? It just absolutely is a real wake up call for us. And I think that a large, some of it also is attributable to the fact that because children are staying home from school, it is the mothers who are making the decision that they have to be at home to, to take care of their children, to, to help their children with their schooling. Whereas you don't see that happening with fathers as much saying, oh, my children are home, I need to be home. So childcare is a huge issue and it's something that we need to address um, in the United States of America as a whole. We need to figure out, a lot of countries have figured out how to make it work so that working moms can work and, and get ahead in their field. What happens a lot of times is the moms are in the, the workforce, but they're the ones who have to go to the doctor's appointments and go home if the child is sick. And so they don't get the promotions like the men do. And this is all part of that systemic problem where we have, and we need to kind of figure out what we're gonna do. Um, when I first started in the legislature, there weren't too many younger women in the legislature. There were people like me whose children had we're leaving the house um, and, and actually Kelly and, and Tina and myself are all sort of in that kind of situation pretty much in the legislature. We need to uh, have more young women. Thankfully, Emily's there for us. 
Um, but we need more young women in the legislature. And it's hard because you have to go to Tallahassee. You have to be away from your family for a long time. But we're starting to see more young women step up and be able to do it. And it's all a systemic issue. And I'm just hopeful that we never see a reporting period like that where all the job losses are for women. Yeah, and you know, um, the new president has a, has a federal plan that would renew the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, which would provide emergency paid leave for over 14 weeks of paid sick and family leave to help workers that provide caregiving for a loved one due to school or child care center closures. Um, it would provide help with, for employees with COVID-19 or someone caring for COVID-19 symptoms and workers self-quarantining due to exposure and for employees to take time to get vaccinated. So I think with our new president, um, we're gonna see some changes that are, are you know, that will help um, women stay employed. Working well needed. Thank you so much. Um, we are running towards the end of our time. So I want to switch over before we get too close to the end and take some of the questions that have been put in the chat box. Um, so Betty Shear asks, uh, criminal justice reform seems like a no brainer. Who are your allies and opponents on the issue? I think that might be in regards to your question or your, your statement, Tina about the reforms you were looking into. Well, I'm, I mentioned criminal justice reform a little bit also that it could be a very big um, say, money saver for our state if we started to do it. Um, it's interesting because some of the um, traditionally criminal justice reform was, was um, an issue more by party but it's become a much more with, with the Democrats pushing it more and some pushback on the Republican side more um, but it's definitely become a much more bipartisan issue and um, some of the, um, the, the larger institutions on the Republican side, I think, um, I forget the name of, there's a group in Tallahassee that's working on it also. And it's because they realize that there's a couple different things include one is the money side and then the other is the justice side and the way that these people are treated. Um, you know, and we've seen medical marijuana now is basically being decriminalized across the whole nation. And we have all these people in jail for, for marijuana charges. Um, so we're getting our, our, and we also, the Black Caucus has been very active in talking about criminal justice reform. So we, we have a lot of coalitions working together. In the Senate, the champion of criminal justice reform has been Jeff Brandis, who is a Republican legislator. He files bills every year. Last year he got, you know, they say that things happen in the Florida legislature in baby steps. So last year he chipped away a little bit. This year he's trying again to chip away further. One of the big things we're trying to do is change what they call gain time. So right now you have to serve 85% of your sentence before you can be uh, paroled. A lot of other states, it's much lower. Florida is one of the highest in terms of that. We're trying to change the gain time to 65%. So a lot more people would be able to be really, uh, released from incarceration if we do that. Um, so there are a lot of people working together. It is kind of a, if you ask me, it's a no brainer, but I did mention it to the Senate president when I met with him and he wasn't as um, excited about it as a lot of the other people. So it's, it's still always, there's always pushback no matter what, even though we have a lot more of a coalition working toward that. Oh, I can add a little to that. It has become certainly more bipartisan than it may have been in the past. But it's like you take one step forward and two steps back. So as Senator Berman mentioned, um, this one senior Senator uh, Brandis, who heads the Judi Judiciary Committee, has a lot of power, keeps putting forth these bills. But if the Senate president isn't interested, it becomes harder. And um, I do believe that there is a little issue there because I have a claims bill for a wrongfully incarcerated person who was... Um, in jail for 37 years and has been found uh, to be innocent and now you know is seeking retribution financial re remuneration from the state and so it goes through this process through the legislature well apparently um you know they're not too thrilled with this claim because 
while he was incarcerated for, while well, the reason he was incarcerated, he was found not guilty. He did have some pettier crimes when he was younger. And so they're not so interested in helping. So um, for some people, there's this very bright line in the sand with, you know, you're a good person or you're a bad person. And so I think that we have to deal with that a lot. But an interesting ally, since that was a question that was asked is, um, I think Senator Berman talked about the anti-protest bill, which is really, a big going to be a big problem, but one ally we have on our side is Americans for Prosperity, which shockingly is you know very I always consider them a very Republican group. Um, all they care about is business and you know cutting taxes, etc. But they're very libertarian and bent, and they don't like um, kind of the muzzling of the voices for the protests. And then now they're upset that there's this anti-doxing provision. There was a RICO provision in the bill, which is not there any longer. And that's what they were initially upset about. So they're normally very much on the side of leadership. And so the fact that they're not, and they came to see me about it, you know, it's interesting, sometimes different bills uh, or different causes get different allies. So there definitely are people we can look to work towards to increase the interest in criminal justice reform. And even, you know, the most recent, uh, you know, Trump administration, he apparently cared and you know freed some people who, besides the ones that were his cronies, uh, there were some people who um, you know may have deserved to be um, freed just through pure criminal justice reform. Right. So we are reaching the end of our time. Um, I want to thank each one of you so much for being here um, and for doing the work that you're doing. I can't imagine. Um, how busy your offices must be right now with everything that's going on. And so thank you so much for taking the time tonight to be with us and to share um, your knowledge and your understanding of this process with everyone. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Ms. Jennifer Krishka. Thank you, Takita. So I echo her comments and big thanks to all of our panelists. And thank you, Takita, for moderating this really important discussion. Um, before everyone signs off, uh, if this event is something that you found really informative and helpful, um, then I encourage you to get involved with both JWF and the Women's Foundation of Florida. Um, JWF is a social change organization and we work to create um, to advance the status of women and girls locally, nationally, and in Israel. Uh, we provide grants, we provide educational and advocacy opportunities, and we have um, two leadership training programs that we run. For more information about uh, JWF, please go to jwfpalmbeach.org. Um, and I also just wanna make a little pitch. You know, Both JWF and the Women's Foundation of Florida are funded basically entirely by you know individual donations and so I always of course encourage people to uh, support the organizations because we can't do these kinds of programs or the work that we do without um, without you know our wonderful donors um, and my last plug before I turn it over to Takeda, I just want to thank um, Eileen Berman and Jay Bauer um, for underwriting our education and advocacy programs. So Takeda, I'm going to turn it to you just to give your brief description of the Women's Foundation and tell people how they can get involved with you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So I am the executive director of the Women's Foundation. Our organization is based in Palm Beach County, but does have our programs that are offered statewide. And our organization is dedicated to empowering and educating women to become leaders so that they can change the world. And we do that through a number of different areas. We have our Women on the Run campaign training program that's going to be kicking off in April. So if you have any interest in learning more about what it takes to run for office, so you can sit among these amazing uh, legislators with us here this evening. Or uh, we also have a program for women who are interested in running for judicial seats. If you are a uh, practicing attorney, we have a program coming up on February 4th. I did put our uh, foundation website in the chat. It's womensfoundationfl.org. And you can check us out and find information about any of our programs. My contact information is there. And so please feel free to reach out if you'd like to learn more about the Women's Foundation. All right, well, thank you again, our panelists, and thank you to everyone who uh, attended today's webinar. We hope to see you again at future events. Um, stay safe and be well. Thank you. Good night. Thank you so much.